officially start. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's very nice to see some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, thanks for coming to Bear Pond Books for the book launch of Eleanor Georgiou's The Immigrant's Refrigerator. Um, and also <laughs> with a discussion on immigration with Lori Stavrand from the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. Um, I am thrilled to host Elena here tonight in Montpelier. I've been lucky enough to hear her read and to attend her workshops while I was a graduate student at Goddard College, where Elena directs the MFA in Creative Writing Program. Her readings are always gorgeous, um, and her workshops always help me generate thoughtful poems and ideas. And I have to admit, I was beyond excited to learn about her new foray into fiction. Um, Elena is an award-winning poet. Um, but I knew that her poetic voice and her affinity for imagery and narrative would produce something amazing. And here it is. <laughs> From the senior who makes watermelon soup for the hungry train boy orphans riding to freedom, to the meat-eating Christian who declares, if the world was, were cooked in pork fat, I think it would be a happier place. <laughs> These stories are delicious. I urge you all to pick up a copy tonight, and I'm sure Elena will sign one for you. Um, Elena will read for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then Lori will present a short video, we hope, <laughs> of, of <laughs> refugee interviews. And then the two will join in discussion about immigration and the issues that surround that. And then there will be time for Q&A. There will also be time for the book signing. We do have refreshments on the table. Please help yourself. I'd like to remind everyone to please mute or turn off your cell phones. And to let you know, the front door is locked. If you need to leave before the reading is over, please use the back door, which is to my right. The bathroom is lo located at the back of the store, to the right of the back door. I'd like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring this event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. Uh, feel free to pick up a Vermont Arts sticker at the counter. They're free. And I'd like to thank Orca Media for filming tonight's event. If you're interested in seeing tonight's video, or in learning about our other events, you can sign up on our newsletter, which has been passed around. Um, next week, we're hosting author Ricky Gard Diamond. She's the author of Screwnomics, which is how the economy works against women and real ways to make lasting change. And she'll be in conversation with the Vermont Commission on Women director, Carrie Brown, who will talk about the state of women's economics in Vermont. Um, be sure to join us. That's May 1st at 7 o'clock. Uh, but tonight, we have Elena Georgiou, many of you know her. Um, she's the author of poetry collections Rhapsody of the Naked Immigrants and Mercy, Mercy Me, which won a Lambda Literary Award and was a finalist for the Publishing Triangle Award. She is also co-editor of the poetry anthology The World in Us, published by St. Martin's Press. She has won an Astrea mm -hmm. Emerging, Artist Award, Emerging Writers Award, a New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowship, and was a fellow at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Her work appears in journals such as Balm, Cream City Review, Denver Quarterly, okay, lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's an editor at Tarpaulin Sky Press and as I said, the director of the writing program at Goddard College. Um, Elena is originally from London where she spent the first 27 years of her life. Um, since then, she's lived in the US and now resides in Southern Vermont. And we have tonight Lori Stavrand, the Community Partnership Coordinator for the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program. She's been there for nine years. And during that time, Lori has had the privilege to help resettle refugees in Vermont whose home countries are Bhutan, Burma, Burundi, Cuba, Democratic Republic of Con Congo, um, Eritrea, Iraq, Rwanda, Somalia, Sudan, and Syria. She has expanded programs at USCRI VRRP, <laughs> including the Crossroads Youth Mentorship Program in partnership with Play in the Wild and the Mosaic of Flavors Cooking Class in partnership with City Market. And can I announce the big upcoming news? Sure. They're putting together a cookbook of um, Ooh, stories and nice. recipes from oh, refugees. Oh, nice. So it, that, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Um, she's expanded public outreach and education, including the Destination BTV annual fundraiser shows at the Burlington Airport and the refugee simulation, the Refugee Journey board game. I, it's fascinating. That's great. It's fascinating. <laughs> Let's welcome Eleanor to read from her debut short story. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make it official. 
I'll stand up. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for coming here today on this first really beautiful Vermont spring day. Um, I hope that when you leave here, you'll go out and have a nice sidewalk cocktail somewhere. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read for 10 to 15 uh, minutes. Um, because I want to keep it brief so that we have time for everything that we want to do, I just want to say it's a book of short stories, obviously, but some of them are very long short stories. Um, and rather than, you know, spend the whole 10 to 15 minutes reading one long short story, um, which I think might be a bit like children's bedtime and might put you to sleep, I thought I, I would read one short one and then give you a little flavor of two more so that that could also be a promotion technique to find out what happens you have to buy the book. Right? So it could work both ways, right? So I'm, gonna, I'm going to, um, and I will say also, you know, um, people are reading this book that don't normally read my work because I've made the transition from poetry to fiction. Mm -hmm. And people are scared of poetry and they're not so scared of fiction. So I'm so one of the things that has come up is, wow, it's a very beautiful book, but it's dark, uh, meaning there aren't that many happy endings <laughs> in the book. And apparently this comes as a surprise when people who know me because they but they don't obviously don't know me very well. Um, so you know, there are some happy endings, some some with humorous moments in them. Uh, but most of them are pretty serious. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to actually uh, read the first one, which uh, Sam mentioned in her intro. It's called Gaspacho, and I don't need to say anything. It becomes self-evident as I as I read. Uh, you know, there's one thing I should say because I, it's uh, uh, half of these stories are in first person. So when it's a woman standing up here reading, the assumption is that it's a woman till it reveals itself that it isn't. So this is in the voice of a man. Okay. Most days of the week, I stand outside the train station with two large plastic buckets of gazpacho. Nothing fancy, mostly mashed up watermelon, onion, cilantro, lime, more to quench their thirsts than to fill their stomachs. The boys come out from their corners. They are quiet. Like their bodies, their movements are small. In their eyes, I see the eyes of my own son. When they realize I have food, they simply say, please, senor. They don't need to ask. They're the reason I live in this border town. I am here to feed them for the last time before they cross into the US, or for the first time they cross back into Mexico. In either direction, I know their journeys have been long. I want to feed them. I need to feed them. If I don't, who will? My heart? Oh, my father broke it a long time ago. Because of this, when I feel another crack inside my chest, it frightens me. As God is my witness, I don't know how much heart I have left. Both my own history and these trained boys are slowly grinding what is broken inside me into a dust. So, I make soup. I cannot sleep when I think that the only thing these children were taken to their bodies are the half-finished cigarettes that others toss away. 14, 13, 12, friends, brothers, sometimes, not often, a girl. They are each other's train family, road cousins. They hide on top of La Bestia. It is illegal, yes, but there is not much the authorities can do. How can they stop these traveling children when there are hundreds of them riding El Train de la Muerte each week? I was once one of them. I made it to the US. Two times, both times I was sent back. After months in the migrant children detention center, I was happy to be returned to my mother. It didn't matter how good they were to me. It didn't matter how good I was at my lessons. I still felt locked up, like they were keeping me in a prison. The first time I thought, I did it, I made it. 
But that America was not like the one on television. TV America is everywhere New York. After the first time I thought I would never ride La Bestia again, but I had to, for my mother, to build her a house with her own bedroom, so she could stop selling food on the street. I wanted to put money in her hands and say, this is yours, no more cutting your own hair. I thought that finding my father in America would be the answer to everything. My plan was simple. I would tell him exactly where and how my mother and I had been living, and he would help. Side by side, my father and I would work. Side by side, we would sign our names at the end of our letters home. Father and son, we would send her our love and our money. At the end of my second journey on La Bestia, I found my father, a miracle. He said, it takes more than one night with your mother to make you my son. He turned his back to me. He closed his door and all the walls of my life, already built on crumbling foundations, would have fallen on top of me if I hadn't stepped sideways out of this old house into the new. My mother died one year ago, five years after my last border crossing, but I am still building a house for her in my head. I have counted the windows, 17. Also, all the rooms will be on the ground, no stairs, because I want this house to wrap around everyone who enters. The first time I went on the beast, I was lucky. I was part of a group, four boys and me. They protected me. We each took it in turns to stay awake and watch out for the others. All five of us had been witnesses to the solo riders. We'd seen how many of them rolled close to the edge of the train while they were dreaming. When someone rolled off, the train stopped for a moment. My oldest road cousin saw someone roll under the train. He didn't tell us what he saw, how the dreaming boy's body was cut, how his legs landed a few feet away from his hands until the biggest part of our train journey was over and we were close to the US border, the border in all of our dreams. We all thought that when we got to America, we would be adopted by new families, born again into the life we were meant for. Of course we thought we were meant for it. We were just the same as the New York boys on TV, except their houses had kitchens as big as churches and refrigerators with so much food, sometimes things were piled on top of each other with a special place for eggs and cheese and meat. But now, I am a 20-year-old father who feeds these rose road cousins gazpacho when the train stops to catch its breath in the station. The rest of the day, I drive a hearse. This is my job for money. When I am driving, hardly a day passes when I do not have to repatriate a child's body. This is what the authorities tell me to call it when they, get, when they give me a dead train child to take back to his mother. There are so many days I've had to repatriate a child's body, it would be easy to lose count. I have not lost count. I have repatriated 257 children's bodies. Each time I load a small coffin into my hearse, a small country turns to dust inside me. I have a wife now. She came into my life with a child, my stepson. I love him like he is my own. I make sure to hold my boy every day. I don't want him to take El Train de la Muerte. I can't imagine, my wife says, as she stands in the river washing our clothes. I'm smoking my first cigarette of the day before I have to drive a dead boy back to his mother. I can't imagine, she says again, how heavy it must be to carry the death of your child. It does not matter how many times my wife says, imagine. I do not imagine. I make gazpacho. When the train's engine comes to a stop, the cousins jump down from its roof, and I step out with my two buckets. Their hunger rids them of their fear of being out in the open. They form a line, 
I ladle my soup into their plastic cups. And that's the end of that one. <laughs> mm. So yeah, so that's the opening story. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't really know. I don't really know what else to say. Maybe when it comes to the Q and A, if you have questions about it, I can speak a little bit more about about the process. But I think the I think the original, if I remember correctly, I think the original seed that I, that was planted in my um, body for that story was that I actually read a newspaper article about a man who whose job it is to drive uh, the bodies. He, uh, he was a hearse driver and, he, and his job was to drive the bodies that fell from the trains back to their mothers. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, you know, I hadn't thought about that before and I tried to imagine what this man's life was like and how he found himself in, the, in this job. So that, that was the initial impetus for that one. And, um, <clears throat> this one, the, I, this one is a long one, and so I'm only just going to I'm just going to read uh, the first two or three pages. It's called Osman's Window, and um, it's about a Somali uh, Bantu man who uh, is resettled in Maine. Um, uh, there, is, there is no, there, w there was no Somali. There wasn't, there wasn't a particular Somali man that I read about. Um, this is a character that I created, but the detail, one of the details that stuck with me, so every, usually what happens is that there's this little detail that stays with me, and out, out of this detail I try and weave a, st a story. So I was thinking about someone coming from a very hot country, uh, resettled in Maine in the winter, <laughs> and I thought, oh my god, you know. Santa Fe would be better, or whatever, <laughs> or New Mexico, and then I, I don't know, I, and so, but the, the, the detail that stayed with me was that I, in the research that I was doing, at least a handful of people said that they preferred to be resettled in a place that didn't remind them of home. So being in this environment was nothing like where they came from, and it was a way of keeping uh, keeping something at bay, so that that was the seed that I planted this that I planted for this story. So it's a long story, but I'm just going to read the first couple of pages, and it's called Osman's Window. Once he got to Maine, the refugee relocation center helped him find a place to live, a room with an apartment with three other Somali men. Two of them shared a bedroom. Osman and the fourth man had bedrooms of their own. In his entire 22 years on this earth, he had never had his own room. Back home, he had shared one room with his three brothers, and in the refugee camps, he had shared a succession of tents with many, many other Bantu, not just men, but women also, to protect each other from late night attacks. In his new room, there was one bed with a small table beside it, and pressed up against the shortest wall, there was a chest, with six drawers for his clothing, though what he owned couldn't even fit to fill two. When he closed his bedroom door to sleep, it shut out all sound except for his own breath. The solitude unnerved him. He lulled himself to sleep by placing his ear to the wall that linked him to the second bedroom, listening to the sleeping breath and the occasional snore of his roommates. The apartment was above a halal grocery store on the main street. On the other side of the street were a number of stores that were run by more of his country people. From the window of his apartment, he could see the Mogadishu Business Center, which offered various services, tailoring, cleaning, and money transfers. For the first few days, he pulled a chair close to the living room window and watched his Bantu brothers and sisters walking beside white people along the main thoroughfare, buying fish, oats, vegetables, and even clothes, and it looked to him as if he had landed in a place of miracles. He'd arrived a little too early for snow. Even so, from the window, he saw Bantus going about their new main days bundled up in coats and boots and hats. 
Through his apart though his apartment included heat, he wrapped a scarf around his neck and pulled a woolen hat down over his ears just so that he could feel like he was one of the crowd. The newness of America, especially the cold, gave him hope that he could push away the bad memories that came with hot days. By the third day of sitting in an empty apartment watching people walk by, his roommates declared the window Osman's window. One of them hung a blanket over the chair and even moved a small table beneath it for Osman to, re to rest his tea. Osman wouldn't have dreamed of sectioning off any part of their apartment and calling it his, but his roommates never sat in that chair or covered themselves with the blanket. Their tenderness towards him made him want to cry. These men were not only careful with him, they were careful with each other. Tentative gestures that came from a lifetime of uncertainty filled the apartment. They walked barefoot over carpeted floors, often surprising one another coming out of a bedroom, their bodies wincing in response. They stirred the sugar in their tea as quietly as they could, as if the sound of spoons clinking against mugs could wake a sleeping predator. In just one week, the Refugee Relocation Center found Osman a job in a small facility that produced handcrafted chocolates. The couple that had begun the enterprise, part factory, part storefront, was also from another country. Twenty years, said Tulio Medina, but with every bit of chocolate we import, we have found a way to bring a little bit of Venezuela to Maine. And this makes us very happy. We hope that you too, as man, will find some happiness here. Welcome. Tulio and Rita Medina both had mothers who had taught them how to make a variety of chocolate-based desserts, and years later, here they were with their own employees, creating their own variations and selling their bean-to-bar and, sh and shaped confection confectioneries to gourmet stores all over the U.S., to Mainers, and to tourists who wandered in to buy their loved ones a special treat. Rita took her time introducing Osman to all the ingredients. She asked him to taste the cream, the fruit, the herbs, and the flowers. She offered him a chocolate that looked like a small sea creature. When he bit into it, a pink cream covered his tongue that tasted like the red berry he had just sampled. What you have there, Osman, is a raspberry cream, seahorse, molded out of dark chocolate with a dusting of sea salt. Everything you have just seen has been artfully made into this perfect taste. Your job will be to pack the chocolate boxes. Do you understand? Osman could not respond to Rita because his mouth was still full of something so perfect that he was afraid to open it in case the taste escaped and never returned. Good, she continued, ushering him through an aisle of trays per of perfectly molded chocolates stacked on metal racks, floor to ceiling. The chocolates were a variety of shapes and sizes, some of which looked like they'd been decorated with gold. Actually, I think I'll stop there. So that's just a taste, a chocolate taste. <laughs> uh, and then I'll give you um, a final taste of, of, of uh, another one. Um, just that you, uh, this makes no difference whatsoever, but a tiny little, a t you know, a tiny little thing. I'll tell you about this. Oh, I don't know. It's a much longer story. <laughs> the, the tiny stories are a really longer story, but the thing that I will tell you is that I, that this book happened because for the first time in my life I got writer's block, and um, and I didn't write for an entire year. And my friend said to me, "So is that it? You're not going to write anymore?" And I thought, "No." Uh, and so uh, actually, my partner said to me, "Just write anything." So I wrote anything and this was the first anything that came out that launched the the stories that followed and it's called uh, again oh well yes i'm not gonna i see the time i'm not gonna even though it's short i'm not gonna read the whole thing because i really want to keep strictly to time it's called how now the top shelf of the refrigerator is where ekaterina keeps the lining of a sheep's stomach cold but not frozen, ready to be unwrapped. Later, she will cut the lining into rectangles, 
fill it with ground lamb, then roll it into finger-sized sausages. This stomach lining is white, which is also the color of a sheep's coat. The first time she needed a woolen coat was when she landed in this new country that wrapped her in a skin of coldness, one that required her to button up all the way to her neck. Though she had buttoned up, tuberculosis still found its way beneath the woolen collar, beneath her skin, and into her lungs. By the time she was given a hospital bed, the landlord had put her family's belongings outside on the sidewalk. I'm sorry, he said. And perhaps he had been a little apologetic, but mostly his voice held fear. Ekaterina's mother, father, and brothers huddled beside their suitcases until another immigrant family across the street took pity on them and offered the family temporary shelter. Pity for one another is something immigrants have in abundance, but they hide it from view. You cannot find pity tucked under an immigrant's arm, along with his newspaper, as he leaves for work in the morning. You cannot see pity in an immigrant's kitchen in the pot in which she is frying the lamb with onions, parsley, cinnamon, pepper, and salt. You also cannot find pity in an immigrant's bootstraps, but it had found a home beneath the bra straps that lifted Ekaterina's tired breasts. The middle shelf of the refrigerator is where she keeps her sheep's milk cheese. After removing it from the shelf, she will crumble it with a fork, its freshness making this easy to do. Then she will sprinkle the cheese with sugar and cinnamon and wrap it in the finest leaf of dough. This cheese-filled dough leaf is called a vachdila, a finger. After it is deep fried, this leaf finger will be the exact shade as her flesh finger. If she is not careful, she could bite into her flesh by mistake. But she's not worried about this. Immigrants learn to be extra careful with, with all of their movements because their new countries have no tolerance for their mistakes. I'll stop there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just take a couple of minutes and see if I can get the video working. <laughs> Computers and small children can't be relied upon. When you were here at 6.30, it was perfect. I saw it. It was great. Um, is there anything I can do Let's see. And politicians. And politicians? Okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know any of those. Did you play with this? Oh, no, no. Did you go back to writing poetry? No, I... I I just finished the second draft of a novel. Oh, really? Yeah. Which I can't talk about <laughs> yet because it's too soon. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. You know, if you want to ask me questions, that would be helpful for yeah. Laurie. You yeah. can go that ahead and do that. And then people yeah. might not. Yeah. yeah. So have you forgotten any poetry or for, that, for now, I wouldn't say, you know, I, I haven't taken an oath or a vow. I'm never going to write 
another poem, and I can't. And I'm sure if I did that, the, the only thing I'd want to write is po poetry. Of course. You know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> um, I just, you know, at the moment, what I need to say is longer than a poem. Or actually, I'm sorry, that's the wrong sentence. What I need to explore mm. is bigger than is longer, not bigger, but longer than a poem. Mm. So that's what I'm doing right now. Mm. How did you um, come to the subject of um, immigrant? Okay, so can you hear? Yes. Uh, how, how did I come to the subject of immigrants? Yes. Um, so, um, <laughs> sorry in advance. I just spent an hour and a half with Carla <laughs> answering the similar questions for her radio show. <laughs> so, you, know, um, so uh, it, you know, I don't make a conscious decision to sit down and write about anything in particular. But, you know, as human beings, I have found that the things that, that we're really invested in come out of a personal place, you know. Um, yeah, I come out of a personal place. If, if you have, if you have uh, a family member who has been incarcerated, maybe you will suddenly be drawn to working with advocacy groups for incarcerated people. If you uh, have, I, I can't think of another example off the top of my head but so for me uh you know um i come from a family of immigrants who then who who and then i and then i immigrated myself so it's like two generations of immigrants uh, but uh, the displaced and the refugee side of it is because in 1974 uh, both my parents are from an island called Cyprus, which used to be a British colony, had 14 years of independence, and then in 1974, Turkey invaded it and cut it in half. And my family happens to be from the half that Turkey took, so everybody was either a refugee or a displaced person. So, all we're, so, so stories about refugees and displaced persons and immigrants always speak to me in one way or another. So I, I was saying I was saying um, I was saying over dinner today, I, I think of myself like a magpie. Like I'm I, I'm like collect I, I hear things and I collect and I collect and I don't know why. I just know that I have to have this little fragment, this little fragment and I make notes and then I just allow and then I sit down and I just allow it whatever rises to the surface to to rise to the surface. So, so the, the, sh the short answer is because I have this history with refugees and immigrants, really. Mm -hmm. Clara? Yeah. I was wondering if you could speak to the title and the, you know, the refrigerator. I've read most yes. of your stories in yes. here, and, and yes. some of it is pretty obviously. Mm -hmm symbolism or metaphor, but I'm curious to hear from you. Yeah, so the book is called The Immig Immigrant's Refrigerator, but the second story is called The Immigrant's Refrigerator. And uh, the refrigerator in that story is very important. Um, the second story is about a young man from Northern Ireland who uh, leaves his troubled country in the 80s and the 90s to come and make a new life for himself in the United States, specifically New York. And um, he's going to a graduate program in creative writing, and he's, <laughs> and he's, you're right, and he's writing short stories, but he <laughs> actually thinks, what the hell am I doing writing short stories? Anyway, so it keeps, <laughs> so there's this adage in the creative writing world that you must never start with a gun, a, a gun being fired or me, never finish it with a gun going off. Or, no, you never start with an alarm clock going off and never end it with a gun being fired. Anyway, so he gets all this negative feedback because he always has bombs going off, uh, you know, in, in, in his work. And, he, and all the people in this program just say, well, that's just, you just can't do that because it's too much of a cliche. And he said, but, but this is my life, right? This is not a cliche, this is my life. I, I, I live with this. So anyway, in one, in one of his stories, he, he says, I don't, my, all my stories fail. 
because instead of focusing on the mother, mo the mother who's dead, who's just been, the bomb has just gone off, instead of focusing on the mother and the children that are dead in the front garden, I'm focusing on the refrigerator. He said, and then he says, no, I'm not actually focusing on the refrigerator, I'm focusing on what's inside the refrigerator, which what's inside the refrigerator is some raspberry jam. And then he says, no, I'm not even focusing on the jar of raspberry jam. I'm, I'm focusing on the seeds inside the raspberries. So, um, so for me in these stories, instead of focusing on the big thing, so I'm trying to focus on, on, on the little thing. I'm trying to focus my stories on the small things that people don't notice. Like, Rather than the rather than the big things, mm -hmm. so and of course you'll see that the you know uh, originally every story in the connect co collection had a different title and the title was one word and 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 it was a food thing. So there's one story called Pork is Love, but it was actually used to be called Pork, and there's one story called What D minus Y equals, and it used to be called Hummus. <laughs> and uh, gazpacho still remained gazpacho. Um, so originally I thought, okay, all, all, all the stories will be one item of food that you find in, in this refrigerator. But ultimately that seemed too easy. And ultimately I wanted to make it more subtle than that and to talk about the small details. But there are refrigerators in most of the stories. <laughs> there's a way to link them. And there's food in every story is a way to link them. But I didn't want it to be like, I didn't want food to be the main thing. I wanted food, food to be the background. Mm -hmm. So that that's basically an explanation of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How, how's it going, Laurie? Did, I you, think we're almost there. You're almost there? Well, <laughs> so one more question, or are you, are you good? Yeah, why don't you do one more question? One more question? OK, anybody else? Question? How much research do you have to do? It depends on the story. Some of the stories come from my personal experience, so not much. Mm -hmm. Some of the stories come outside of my personal experience, so a bit more. Uh, I try not to do too much is a delicate balance between being didactic mm -hmm. and um, and really allowing your imagination to take over. So I do it, and then I try and forget about it. You know, so um, every, everyone to a, there's a different amount of research. It's mm -hmm. not equal. Um, I think the most that I did was for Osman's window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we there, Laurie? It won't co cooperate. So I think what I'm going to do is apologize. <laughs> and if you want to stay later, I'll try again. But I don't see how it's going to happen. Do you want to tell us about the Yes. <laughs> so, what are you going to see? You are going to see a Somali Bantu woman. And the reason you're going to see a Somali Bantu woman is because um, this is a person who we settled uh, in Vermont, in the Burlington area, and has been here a little while. And you see her over time talking about what's important to her. Uh, so a lot of the stories in this book are really dark. <laughs> what's really important to remember is those stories, just like your life, they're a moment in time. Mm -hmm. And you know, in a refugee's life, there are moments in time when, when life is really dark. It's impossible. And then there are really incredible, joyous times. And um, the thing about refugees is they have to keep that hope alive. And that is one of the hardest things about our time right now. It's very hard. It's very stressful for people uh, who are here, people who are overseas, um, to feed that hope, keep it going. Um, 
The people who we have resettled here uh, come from families that are, are, many of them have family members that are still overseas who were even ready to come and they're not here. Um, so it's so important for every one of us, just like Elena is doing, to support uh, refugee resettlement, to give people hope. Because um, they're going to do the work. It's not easy when people get here. Um, it's not just about it's not just about you know having a place to live or food on the table. Um, you know you're coming from a whole other culture. Uh, you you may or may not know the language, you've, but you've got to know American English. Uh, you've got to be working at the pace, American pace, which doesn't leave very much time for family and friends. Um, so there's, there's um, basically in the US, a refugee has to hit the ground running because they have three to six months to become self-sufficient. So in Vermont, we're very fortunate. We have more grants. Uh, we've gotten some competitive grants that can help people um, for a longer period of time till they're employed, till they're, they're more settled. Um, but in some places in the US, they don't even really have that three months because each person who comes um, to the US gets $925 a person. And that's it. Yeah. So that's supposed to last for three months. <laughs> I don't know what rents are like here in Montpelier, but up in uh, Chittenden County, it doesn't go very far. As you can imagine, mm. um, so people, we what we're doing is we're helping people um, make a plan. You know, we're receiving them, we're welcoming them at the airport, and then we're looking at who they are, what they want to do, what their capacity is, what the opportunities are. We're, and then we're helping them to um, you know start basic steps up the ladder. Um, so at first they're really tired. You can imagine you've been traveling for 30 hours. Um, everything's new. You could be arriving summer, winter, spring, fall. Um, you could have family here. You could not have family here. Uh, most of our staff are uh, former refugees themselves. Uh, we always have somebody who can speak. Uh, refugees language so we're able to communicate with them which is really critical um, and from that point forward they have to get brave enough to go out and you know see what their neighborhoods like you know walk down the street go to the grocery store um, just the, the basic basics you know kids start in school uh, starting a job if you have had a job where um, you were a professional, you can be sure in the US it's not going to be easy to get back to that point. There's a lot of hurdles. Um, the, um, the person in this video came um, and had, has had five children. She had a couple children before she came. She had some more children when she was here. Um, she graduated from high school, so she finished her high school education. She finished her, got a bachelor's, and now she's studying for her master's. She's um, been given uh, leadership awards in the community. She just wants to do it all. You know, she wants to give back. She's so grateful for the opportunities she's had, her family's had and a uh, very inspiring woman. Uh, and I, one of the reasons I particularly wanted you to see this is when you see a woman in a hijab, please don't just put her in some little box and think you know exactly what her life is like and you know what her aspirations are and her opportunities, um, because you can't do that. Every person is different and their life circumstances are different. Uh, I'd like to know what you would like to know, um, and would like to say that um, refugees 
are a specific, um, it's a specific immigration status. So you could, um, you, there's many different ways you can immigrate to the U.S. and to come as a refugee means you have had no other viable option. This is like the last chance you have to really make a life. And the average length of time that someone um, has been a refugee from the time they fled their home until they come to Vermont is 20 years. So it is not quick. Yeah. Um, so yes. You started saying that, uh, talking about hope, and I wondered uh, what you see is the most helpful people can do, the most helpful things people can do to make possible the admittance of more refugees into reunified families. What should we be doing to yeah. make it possible? We live in a state where our uh, congressmen are supportive of refugee resettlement and actually take a leadership role. Um, so it's not a bad idea to tell them thank you. Um, if you have friends and relatives who are in other states that are not supportive of refugee resettlement, engage them in conversation. You know, share resources, help them learn more about you know, who a refugee is, why should we have this humanitarian program? Um, because we've really got to, we've got to move uh, people to action. And um, one of the hard things about this point in time is there's a lot of action required on a lot of different fronts, and people, I think, are feeling a little buffeted. Um, this, this is really important. Um, so that's one thing you can do. Um, another thing you can do is you can be really welcoming and look at what that means you know, within the context of your own life. Uh, if you are um, wanting to get involved, wanting to volunteer, if you're meeting somebody you know, at the grocery store, just saying hi and, and being a great neighbor so that you're supporting people here who are literally supporting other people who are not here. Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there is the thought some people have um, that refugees become more Americanized once they're here in the sense that they become more individualistic. And in fact, they don't. Their culture is much more collectivist. And so they're always thinking about helping their, their family, regardless of where they are. It's not out of sight, out of mind. So um, Vermont is considered to be one of the best places to be resettled. Uh, because we do, we do tend to be closer to the collectivist way of being in the world. We do have great sense of community and support for one another. And so really making sure that the people who are coming uh, feel that in whatever way you have within your daily life. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about the kids. I'm a teacher. Was yeah. In, and when I was a public school teacher, the number of children of, of immigrants and refugees and that dynamic of how the young people became um, you know, very involved in the United States life so quickly and then had parents. So that, that whole that, that challenge of navigating the different cultures, do you know what I mean? And then yeah. I, I went to Burlington High School because I was supervising a student teacher there. I'm relatively new to Vermont. I was amazed how many immigrants high schoolers were there, and I was thinking about the dynamic. Is there anything you could share about what, what your experience has been and what supports their art? Because it's the navigation of, of it's, it's like a, it's layered. It is very much layered. Um, the reason that people would go through everything it takes to get here, and it's hard, you know, you're going through a long process to, to do the resettlement, and then you know you're leaving other family behind the reason people will do that is they, they do it for their children because they know their life is not going to necessarily um, 
reach a place where they wish it would be, but they hope that that's what would happen for the children. So once they get here, um, they're willing to, to do major sacrifices, work two jobs, whatever it takes, so that their kids can be going to school. And then the kids are learning language faster, they're learning culture faster, and you have that challenge where the kids are adjusting, but they're starting to lose the language, <laughs> you know, the home language, or maybe not getting up to the same level of language as their parents and grandparents, so communication becomes more challenging. It's, um, it's one of the, the biggest stressors and also the biggest opportunities for refugees. Um, so what it takes at the school level is being able to see each student for who they are. And the assumption, we cannot assume, whether it's a, you know, a youth or an adult, that it's a clean, they are a clean slate. They are not. And that, that kind of is an American way of thinking. We're going to teach the world everything. <laughs> You know, we know the right way, um, and we need to slow down, step back, and meet each person, see what's possible. So with a student going into school, um, probably they've got some English. They probably don't speak one language. They probably have multiple languages. Being able to see that, appreciate that, build on that. They have world experiences that um, have enabled them to mature in ways that our kids don't have to yet. You know, they're more sheltered, uh, just living, you know, in a in Vermont, or even if you've moved around. So, honoring, respecting those kids is really an important first step. Um, we've started a um, a program, a mentor program, specifically for uh, high school students that um, is based on nonviolent communication, the philosophy of nonviolent communication. And that um, starts with honoring yourself. So for a youth to honor themselves, love themselves, so that that's how they go out into the world as they're getting pushed and pulled by their parents and their community or by the school and their friends, that they can, can stay more balanced in terms of what's important to them and sort of um, draw from what, where they're seeing the strengths for them, them personally and also how it relates back to their family because all of these youth are considered an important um, resource support for their families. As they're go getting more educated, they're going to work, they expect that they will then be taking care of their parents. So it's just, it's not, not written, it's just understood. Um, what has happened is um, it's been really hard for everybody to uh, see who people are and not patronize them. And, you know, at the edu in education, you can imagine how important that is. Uh, so you can't say, oh, I, you know, I've met this one student, so now I've got it. You know, or I've, this one group of people will really resettle, the next group's going to be similar. You always have to be opening up your mind. Um, and it is a challenge. For educators, but it is also an opportunity. Um, I c recently had uh, two of my stepchildren come to the U.S. from the Republic of Congo, and my stepson, who's in high school, doesn't fit um, the mold that educators are thinking that he should be, and. Um, and recently, one of his teachers asked him if he would share with students, how do you do calculus without a programmable 
<laughs> calculator. <laughs> now, can you imagine, you know, in the world today, there are people who do not have a TI-84, and still they can do calculus. And I was just so thrilled to hear him say that, because that meant this educator was, was truly thinking about the opportunity that everybody in the class had. So this kid had never used this fancy calculator and had to learn. And the other students, you know, that's like ancient history. I mean, how could you not do it that way? Uh, and, and so there, there's these great opportunities that are happening in, the, in these um, classrooms, in these schools, uh, to open up um, our kids' minds. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to go overseas to um, to learn that there is another way to be. And when you are living around everybody all being exactly the same as you, then it's easy to not be so mindful about choices because. You know, it's just natural. Well, this is how you do it, and this is how you do that. And then when you see somebody else's, somebody you know, like, you know, like a refugee who's been resettled here, is doing it really differently, then there must be other options. And so it's, um, what has happened is people getting connected with uh, refugees resettling is a lot of people have thought about, well, what are the basics? What do I need? Why do I need it? What should I be grateful for? Um, and I, I think that that is one of the biggest contributions that they're making. Other questions? Um, what percentage or do most of the refugees who come here tend to be successful or do some of them want to leave the United States and want to leave for a moment? Find it too much of a change for you? Um, you have the full spectrum. Because refugees are human beings and there's the full variety. Um, most, most of the people who resettle in Vermont end up being very successful. They end up being self-sufficient very quickly. Not talking about wealthy. You know, paying the bills, keeping a roof over their head, food on the table. Um, and that, that is the baseline that we're aiming for. Some people are able to um, move ahead more quickly. Um, we have quite a few families, especially because families live together multi-generationally, that will budget very carefully. And even on basically entry level um, wages, save enough money to buy a house, you know, three or four years. You know, because they've got a plan. You know, they're motivated. Um, there are some people who come who um, are older, and um, change is harder. You don't learn a language as quickly when you're older. Um, if you've been living in a refugee camp for 20 years and not had good food and shelter and medical care, it does take its toll. Um, but families, um, they support each other. And each person in the family plays an important role. So if um, grandma or grandpa wasn't there, it would be a huge hole. You know, they're either offering their wisdom or uh, helping to take care of the kids or just being there. Um, so if they were on their own, that they would be on our own in our culture, they, they probably would be failing, but they're not in the context, in their cultural context. We've had, in the nine years I've been there, um, some people have moved out of state to other states. Usually they will do that to join family that's been resettled somewhere else. Um, sometimes people will go out of state because we have a glass ceiling. And it's really hard for a refugee, a former refugee I should say, because you're not a refugee your whole life, just until you get your permanent residency. Um, 
which takes a year. Uh, some refugees are getting great college educations, and the people are not seeing that they need to hire them, you know, to be working in the schools or doing social services or in the law firms or whatever. And that's one of the challenges we really want to work on now. Um, it's 80% of people, 80% of jobs um, that people get are because they know somebody. And so that's another thing you could do if you want to be helpful is to share your network and, and share opportunities. Um, so we've got, we have some people who are moving to Ohio. Now think about politics. People are leaving Vermont because Vermont won't give them a job and going to Ohio where they'll get a job at the level that they should be working. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy for everybody to get a job, but there is a clear pattern. Um, and then we have people who move in, you know, because there's family here or they've heard They've heard how safe and quiet Vermont is. Mm -hmm. And as a refugee, that's a big selling point. Mm -hmm. A huge selling point. Yeah. Yeah. What does it take for them to transition from refugee visa to resident? Is that do they have to have a sponsor or an employer? Or how does that work? When a refugee comes to the US, um, the State Department has selected them to come. So they're basically invited by the US government and they have refugee status. At the point when they've been here a year, they're expected to apply for their green card. That is part of the continuum. Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, pro bono legal services in our office to assist people in that application process, which has gone from like a, I don't know, five page to 18 page application this year. <laughs> um, so that's really important. And then at five years, they're eligible to become citizens. Mm -hmm. And so we also have citizenship classes that people can study and take the test and become citizens. So it's, um, if someone um, has been here longer, it, sometimes it happens people are, are still thinking because they have an accent or maybe they dress differently that they're a refugee, but they're not. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned nonviolent communication. Are you talking about the Rosenberg model? Yes. No. So um, one of the things that I do in the community partnership program is connect uh, youth with uh, different programs in the community, including summer camps. And um, so imagine you're going to a family, you know, a refugee family that's been in a refugee camp for 20 years, and you're telling them, I have this great opportunity for your kids to go to camp this summer. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to live out in the wild, and there's no electricity. And, um, you know, sometimes it takes a little while to they understand what a great opportunity is. Sometimes they want to seize it because then they realize, oh, the kids are going to really get some skills that they would need. Um, so we, um, for many years, we were um, helping kids to go to this um, camp that's a play in the wild camp that's based on, on nonviolent communication. And it's also a multilingual camp. Mm -hmm. And they honor every child's first language. Mm -hmm. So they feel that. And you, you, I'm sure you've all experienced this. When someone's speaking in their first language, you feel them, you, you see them. And then when they have to, to go to another language, it's like it's kind of dulled down a little bit, in part because maybe they're having to think about the words, but also it's the language itself and, and you know, how the language works. So this camp has enabled um, kids to go and speak Swahili or, uh, you know, and they actually have had camp counselors speaking these languages, but if a kid speaks a language that isn't there, they still honor that in a lot of what their activities are, because you can hear, feel, sense what someone's saying, even if you don't know the words. And we've been able to um, 
have kids go to camp who have been here less than a month. You know, they arrive in the summer, what are you going to do in the summer? And it was so successful. You could see such a great um, uh, transformation great way to integrate into the U.S. that we uh, then decided to partner and do this program with teenagers. So uh, if you want to be a mentor, we're looking, if you're 21 or older, we're looking for men to be with boys and women to be with girls, and you do get training in nonviolent communication. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Are the programs just in Burlington, or are there, like, the Montpelier, is there anything? Uh, we are not resettling. We haven't resettled refugees in Montpelier for a long time. We have had some um, Cubans choose to live in Montpelier. Uh, and the Cuban um, Cubans were called parolees. I love the language. Oh. It's really <laughs> wow. In the U.S. Totally. Um, and, um, but that, that's really been it. And it's too far away to, to uh, really create, and, and your housing is too limited to really create a community here. Um, so we um, have been working with an organization called CV RAND to try to see what kinds of connections we can create here. We're really hoping that people will choose to move from Chittenden County to the Montpelier area and, and build this, you know, like a, it's a secondary migration mm -hmm. here. And hasn't happened yet, but it just takes one or two families and then people see how wonderful it is and it can go from there. And it, I think the, the key to that will really be this job upgrade we're talking about. Because there's certain kinds of jobs you have around here. Um, the uh, refugee resettlement program changed from what it was like in the 80s when um, it was done uh, by churches or community groups and you resettle a family or two here, a family or two there. People didn't stay. You know, they felt lonely. They wanted a peer group. So then um, at the federal level, the decision was made, let's really create small communities within, mm -hmm. you know, the whole community so that there can be some, um, people can put their roots down. I, I just had a quick question. You mentioned that you haven't been resettling people here for a long time, but I know a number of families that are Bosnian refugees. But maybe they settled here a long time. They came in the 90s. Okay. I used to have a, a neighbor. Oh, no, she came. It was early 2000s, though. Yeah. Early 2000s. Okay. Yeah. So that was when. Yeah. She was old. She was yeah. like 10 years old, and um, I used yeah. to help her with her homework because her parents didn't speak English, mm -hmm. and even, you know, I think even now they they really just never learned. They were a little stubborn, <laughs> and. Mm -hmm. um, I tutored her for like five, like all through middle school and high school for many years. Um, and we're still close. She went to college. She got married. Now we're still pretty close. It's a case. But you know, I didn't I didn't realize that that had ended because I I do still see Bosnian other Bosnian families in the area. Yeah, they stayed. Yeah. Okay. So we resettled Bosnians in the Barry, primarily the Barry area. We had a very small office for a short time. We found that most people ended up moving to Chittenden County, and some people stayed. Uh, we also resettled Mishkedi and Turks in the Waterbury area, but once again, they didn't end up staying. So um, it you, you really want to help someone get a start in life that's sustainable. We've had. Um, not in the last year, but you know, years before that, many communities reaching out saying, we would like to have some refugee families coming to our area. But when uh, we looked at housing, you have to have apartments. Mm -hmm. yep. And you have to have public transportation for people to get started. And um, it's 
Vermont is pretty rural, you know, we're, mm -hmm. and we're not large population centers. So um, we're, we've been looking for other ways for people to be connected and engaged because the state of Vermont is for selling refugees, not Chittenden County. Mm -hmm. We did resettle three Syrian families in Rutland, mm -hmm. and they're doing really well. Mm -hmm. um, and they, um, I think they're going to stay in Rutland. Uh, they're creating careers for themselves. Um, and uh, we had hoped that that would have been an ongoing program, but it couldn't be because what's happening with um, immigration and, and refugee resettlement at the federal level. Maybe someday it can happen again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we don't see when that, right now we don't see how that will happen until there's some changes. Yes? So I'm wondering if I can ask a question of Eleanor. Absolutely. Uh, I'm interested in who, who Jen Pop Books is, the publisher. Very interested. In, it's an independent publisher that's based in Vermont. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not really sure what what more to tell you. Um, Do they specialize? Uh, no, no. Uh, not. I mean, they they publish a little bit of poetry. They publish a little bit of fiction. Um, uh, but they haven't put that that many books out. But they've been very supportive of Goddard College. Um, they they published um, about two or three uh, uh, Goddard College faculty, and they um, actually, our, our faculty. Um, you know, in, in the program we have to do keynotes and uh, commencement addresses, and uh, because we have. Um, two sites, we have a, a Vermont site and we have a Washington site. That means that we have um, about uh, three, six, twelve, we have about twelve keynotes a year and two uh, four commencements a year. And so we've collected them and made books. And the, the first year, it was, I can't remember the name of the press, it was affiliated with Cal, Cal Arts, I think, put out our first edition and then Jen Pop has just this month put out the second collection of MFA faculty um, keynotes and commencement speeches. So they're, they're just a small Vermont press that's been supportive of the college, really, and but has published also uh, other other people locally. You can find them online. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'd like thank to remind you. everyone that tonight. Um, 10% of the profits from the sale of Element Book will be donated to the Vermont Refugee Resettlement Program, so that's a, a good way to help both our local author and the, the program, too. You know, I have, I have one other question. Aside from money, mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that people can donate that's helpful to resettlement, to, to, to your actual program? Yeah. Um, so, the basics, when people come, we have to set up their house. Um, and remember, they've got $925, so <laughs> we're not going to go out and buy a mattress or a large pot or you know, any of the things that you need just you know, the, to um, welcome people home. Um, so we do accept donations uh, of things that are gently used and things that are new. Um, and on our website, it lists what we accept. Um, we also um, are looking for volunteers. We do have people who come from as far as Montpelier or further, and uh, will come up once a week and volunteer and be connected, usually with a specific family or individual. And that's really the best when you get to know somebody, and um, and it's. As a family friend or um, a mentor, um, even it's not hierarchical like this. You know, it's really neighbor helping neighbor, even as a mentor. Uh, and in that relationship, 
people find they learn so much about themselves. I am shocked at where I was nine years ago, eight years ago, yesterday, in terms of who I am, what I thought, what I have to, you know, where do I need to go um, as a human being. And um, it's not like you're going to ask people to teach you. It's just like you're holding a mirror up to yourself, and you're starting to notice entitlement, white privilege, that is pretty shocking. Um, and it feels good to be working on it. It feels really great. It can be tough work, um, but we as Vermonters really need to do it. Um, some people think we are there. We are not there at all. Um, and I would say, you know, no one on our staff, regardless of where they're from, think they're where they need to be. We can all learn how to be better human beings. I'd like to offer you a, a sticker. <laughs> <laughs> so you could put this on your water bottle, or a laptop, or a car, or a window. Everyone, everywhere, equal value. We truly mean that, because uh, we all benefit from that. So, And then there's other information up here if you're interested. It takes some information. So, so we'd just like to invite you to support this wonderful independent bookstore, to support uh, Vermont uh, refugees being resettled and um